Good afternoon and welcome to the Niskanen Center's briefing on the weaknesses of our healthcare system as revealed by COVID-19. I'm Kodiak Hill Davis, the Director of Government Affairs at Niskanen, and I'll be the moderator for today's discussion. For anyone who may be unfamiliar with Niskanen, we're a five-year-old 501c3 think tank based in Washington, DC. And while we are nonpartisan, our policy work focuses on market-based solution and the promotion of an open society. A quick reminder before we get started that there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we encourage you to submit questions throughout the discussion and our panelists will answer them at the end. Our panelists today are two of Niskanen's esteemed senior fellows, Ed Dolan and Jeffrey Flyer. Ed holds a PhD in economics from Yale and spent decades teaching econ all over the world. His work focuses on fiscal and monetary policy. Jeff is an MD and the former Dean of Faculty at the Harvard Medical School. He has been an active contributor to the policy debates at the intersection of health and science for decades. Without further ado, I'll turn the conversation over to Ed to get us started. Okay, uh, thanks for having me on here. Uh, thanks for all the people at uh, Niskanen for organizing this discussion. Um, I'm going to start out here with a short slideshow and then uh, we'll progress to an open discussion. So let me uh, take a second here to switch to the slideshow and we'll be off and running. Okay. Um, so we're talking today about some of the weaknesses of uh, <clears throat> that of the U.S. healthcare system have been revealed by this crisis. Nothing like a good crisis to uh, show out <laughs> who's been swimming without a bathing suit, as they say. And I want to focus uh, particularly on three issues today. Um, first of all, to look at where our healthcare system has failed us during the COVID pandemic. Uh, secondly, to talk about what we can do to do better. And uh, third, really to uh, review the broader question of whether healthcare reform as we know it is even relevant anymore in this world of uh, the pandemic and beyond. <clears throat> Talking about healthcare, by, by healthcare reform as we know it, what um, I mean is the kind of reform proposals have been discussed so intensely in the last few years. Um, first during the Republican effort to repeal and replace Obamacare and then during the uh, Democratic presidential campaign. I'm going to focus on three of those uh, proposals today. Uh, on the Democratic side, I'm going to look at uh, Joe Biden's health care plan, which basically is a plan to expand on uh, Obamacare. I'm going to look on the Republican side at a plan called the Fair Care Act, sponsored by uh, Congressman Bruce Westerman of uh, Arkansas, and uh, look at a nonpartisan plan called Universal Catastrophic Coverage that is um, being promoted by Niskanen Center. So I'd like to look at how each of these uh, would help uh, the issues of the day, uh, if indeed they would help at all. First problem I'd like to look at, the first problem that really has been exposed by uh, the crisis is problems with the employer-sponsored insurance system. <laughs> employer-sponsored insurance, or ESI, has been called, and I think correctly, the original sin of US healthcare policy. It was an accidental byproduct of uh, wartime wage controls when companies weren't allowed to pay their workers more. They got around that by offering additional fringe benefits. Now covers more than half the US population, four fifths of the part of the population that are covered by private insurance uh, come under ESI. <laughs> so, what holds the system in place are three pillars we might see. The first one is a so-called employer mandate, which is a feature of the uh, ACA, uh, Affordable Care Act, that says that uh, larger companies uh, must offer their employees uh, some form of health insurance. The second pillar that uh, keeps it in place is the tax deduction. 
That is, uh, employees uh, do not have to pay income tax on their benefits. And the third element that holds employer-sponsored insurance in case is the so-called firewall. Firewall is a provision that means that if you have a credible offer of employee-sponsored insurance where you work, uh, you're not allowed to pass that up and then move to take advantage of uh, private programs that are offered on the ACA exchanges. Now, uh, employer-sponsored insurance isn't all bad. 70% of people say that they're satisfied with their plans, whatever that means. Uh, frankly, I think a lot of them are satisfied only in the sense that they're happy to have some form of health insurance at all. Um, and some employers like uh, ESI as an employee retention measure. But here are some of the negatives. First big negative of ESI is a phenomenon called job lock, which is the fear that moving to a new job or becoming self-employed or going to the gig economy is going to cause loss of coverage. Um, it's pretty clear that a job lock has reduced uh, employee turnover, the so-called transition rate, as we can see in this graph, has been falling for a number of years. And um, the results of low turnover mean wasted productivity because people aren't as well matched to their jobs as they should be, and less career satisfaction. <laughs> ESI is also very unequal because it's based on uh, tax deductibility. The benefits of ESI are higher for high paid employees who pay a high tax rate. And furthermore, uh, low wage employees are less likely to get ESI in the first place. So the estimated value of ESI as shown on this chart is only $500 a year for workers in the lowest fifth of the wage distribution, but it's worth about $4,500 a year for people at the top. So it's a program that helps that really helps the rich get richer in, in that sense. But the most notorious feature that has been revealed by the current crisis is the fact that ESI is the coverage that magically goes away just when you need it most. Uh, Kaiser Family Foundation has estimated that 48 million people are likely this year to lose their employer-sponsored insurance because of job loss. Of course, they have some options. Some of them will be able to get uh, ESI through a family member who also who has kept their job. Some of them will be able to move to the ACA exchanges in special enrollment periods. Some of them will be able to move to Medicaid. But three to five million people, according to Kaiser, uh, are going to be eligible for none of the above and will become uninsured. Furthermore, not everyone who's an eligible will enroll. We already know that a lot of people before the crisis who were eligible for either Medicaid or ACI exchanges weren't enrolled in any of those. And furthermore, uh, changing coverage in the middle of a pandemic is no joke. When you change coverage, uh, you often are going to have to change for a different hospital network, a different provider. You're going to have to offer, argue with a new insurer about exactly which drugs are covered and so forth. There are going to be, and this is not exaggerated, tens of millions of administrative hours devoted just to changing insurance during the period of unemployment. And of course, for many people changing it right back to DSI when the crisis ends, it's a ridiculous waste. So how would each of our reform plans help the situation? Well, under the Biden plan, uh, there would be a little bit of a move away from ESI. The Biden plan, uh, <clears throat> retains the employer mandate and the tax deduction, but it adds a Medicare-like public option uh, on the ACA exchanges, and it removes the so-called firewall so that under the Biden plan, job losers could more easily move to a public option. And as a matter of fact, even if you don't lose your job, even if you keep your job, you could stay with the public option, the ACA exchange, even after you go back to work because the firewall is not there anymore. So on balance, the Biden plan would slightly nudge workers away from ESI toward the public option. The Fair Care Act, the Bruce Westerman plan, um, takes a little bit more aggressive stance toward ESI because it removes not only the employer mandate, but also uh, the, as, uh, and also the firewall, although it retains the tax deduction. 
Uh, it adds another uh, type of employer, uh, other options to employer benefits, something called employer-sponsored health reimbursement, which means that um, employers essentially can give their employees the money to buy private insurance if they want. Expands premium subsidies on the exchanges. Um, so it would be a little bit easier for job losers to move to a private plan or Medicaid, and they could stay there uh, even after their place of work reopened if they chose to. So on balance, the Fair Care Act, like the Biden plan, perhaps a little bit more aggressively would allow people to move away from ESI toward private policy. Universal catastrophic coverage uh, would be more aggressive still. It removes all three pillars, employer mandate, tax deduction, and the firewall, and replaces those with universal catastrophic policy. That is a policy that uh, has a full uh, first dollar coverage per people who are very poor or very sick, and income-based deductible and out-of-pocket costs for people in between. Uh, it would permit employees employer-sponsored supplementary coverage, which possibly some uh, employers would continue to offer as an employee retention measure. But job losers under UCC would have no interruption whatsoever of their UCC coverage because that would already be in place and would stay in place. It wouldn't make any difference whether you change jobs, quit voluntarily, were fired or whatever. And if loss of a job uh, led to a sudden decrease in your income, the size of your out-of-pocket obligation would decrease along with your income. So on balance, uh, UCC, universal catastrophic coverage, really would completely end ESI as we know it. <clears throat> Let's turn now to a second problem uh, that some of these reform plans would address, and that is the problem of preventive care. Uh, there's a popular belief that an ounce of pre prevention is worth a pound of cure, but that's probably not nearly as true as many people believe it to be. Uh, more often than not, preventive measures like, let's say, a colonoscopy or uh, something like that, uh, they, they may be a, a good buy healthcare wise. They may have uh, health benefits that more than outweigh their cost, but they don't actually reduce the total cost of the health care bill. But uh, prevention of contagious disease is among the most cost effective of all forms of preventive care. Now, in normal times, because uh, preventive care, uh, particularly in the form of vaccinations, is uh, so uh, cost effective that the ACA waives deductibles and copays for approved vaccinations and screenings. And under the Biden campaign, uh, under the Biden plan, the Fair Care Act and UCC, they would all do the same essentially. So in a pandemic, prevention takes on a new face. Uh, in a pandemic, we'd have a new disease to add to the covered list, but more importantly than that, the distinction between treatment and prevention is blurred uh, because in order to minimize contagion during a pandemic, insurance has to cover all costs, not just screening and testing, but also vaccination if it's available and treatment of active cases because once we identify a positive case, we wanna make sure it's being treated so those people don't pass it along to someone else. And furthermore, uh, people have costs of supported isolation, that is uh, quarantines during which they are paid uh, essentially not to go into uh, out into public. So any reform uh, needs to uh, make it easy uh, to add this sort of coverage without new legislation. So uh, the answer to the question is uh, of whether or not health reform as we know it is irrelevant is no, it's not irrelevant because health reform in the form of the familiar reform plans we see um, are uh, going to be helpful with regard to lessening the pain of job loss and also in order to improving uh, coverage of uh, testing and uh, treatment for pandemic diseases. But <clears throat> the reform plans as we know them uh, all have one defect. And that is that they all are written in a way that assumes that today's business model 
for providers, which is based on insurance and fee for service is going to continue. And that model has failed spectacularly to allocate costs fairly among the major players during the pandemic. Major players here being insurance companies, hospitals, patients, and government. Let's see exactly what the problem is here. First of all, we have an insurance-based system. Can insurance actually work during a pandemic? Perhaps not. Uh, there are some famous conditions that make certain risks uninsurable. Two of those are the if the probability of loss can't be calculated um, or if the loss would strike everyone in the risk pool at the same time, those risks then become technically uninsurable. And pandemic risk certainly pushes the limits of insurability. Although some people were afraid that the insurance industry would take a huge hit during the COVID pandemic, so far insurers are doing okay. Partly that's because although COVID is widespread, uh, most cases are asymptomatic. Uh, partly it's because canceled elective surgeries have lowered claims by more than COVID has raised them. Partly it's because a disproportionate number of COVID patients are covered by government programs, either Medicare or Medicaid, that's because COVID selectively seems to strike low income people and older people. Uh, and finally, uh, insurers are off the hook partly because no expensive treatments have yet been approved for COVID. If somebody came up with a uh, $100,000 pill that would cure you, the insurers would be in instant trouble. But insurers aren't completely out of the woods yet because uh, postponed elective surgeries may be, take place next year. There may be a second or third uh, wave of illnesses. Expensive new therapies may uh, keep sick people alive longer at greater costs. And looking ahead, uh, although we all hate even to think about it, the next pandemic may be even worse. We may one day wake up to find that we have a virus around which is as contagious as measles and as deadly as Ebola, and then we're in real trouble. So uh, possible sh solutions for insurers uh, that could be added to reform plans as a contingency measure would be some form of government sponsored reinsurance that would assume the highest and most expensive risks and allow uh, conventional insurers to keep their premiums low. In fact, uh, the Fair Care Act already includes a form of reinsurance that could without too much work be adapted to pandemic conditions. Also universal catastrophic care uh, itself, uh, since it uh, automatically covers the most expensive cases is really a form of reinsurance. Um, and uh, supplemental insurers, since their losses would already be capped, could probably uh, purchase some form of con commercial reinsurance if they needed to. Uh, I don't see any immediate provision uh, for to handle this problem in the Biden plan. Now, so much for insurers. The flip side of the fact that insurers doing, are doing better than expected is the fact that hospitals are doing poorly, uh, much worse than expected. In part, this really is a pricing problem. Um, <laughs> hospitals are an example of an industry with high fixed costs and many products in any industry like that uh, has to allocate its fixed costs to services where the price resistance is the least and price other services closer to marginal cost. So the current pricing model for hospitals puts very low prices on Medicare and Medicaid services, somewhat higher uh, prices on the same services when offered to privately insured payments, and the highest prices on elective procedures, especially elective surgeries. During this crisis, the business model has failed because of the suspension of electric proce election procedures to many Medicare and Medicaid patients. In fact, some hospitals which are medically lucky end up economically unlucky. An example would be our lower, our local hospital here in uh, Northern Michigan, which has cleared out its elective patients and failed to have uh, any COVID patients show up to fill the empty beds. <clears throat> the CARES Act makes a somewhat feeble attempt to address this problem by giving a 20% bonus 
uh, in the Medicare rate for treating COVID patients, but that's not nearly enough. Universal catastrophic coverage would help a little bit because it would defragment the insurance business by paying same rates for uh, Medicare and Medicaid as for everybody else, leveling rates out and removing the distortion, uh, but that would not necessarily be a complete cure. So what do we end up with here? What's the bottom line? The bottom line is, yes, all of these, any of these reforms, the Biden plan, the Fair Care Act, universal catastrophic, condition would somewhat uh, improve the response to a pandemic compared with existing policy. Second point I'd like to make in conclusion is that all of these plans, the authors of all of these plans need to rethink them, need to add uh, contingency measures that could be activated in a pandemic without having to wait for new legislation, which is always a fraught and slow process. And finally, we really have the lesson that health insurance alone uh, cannot address all public health needs in a pandemic. We've got quarantines and social distances, social distancing, we have business interruptions, we have income replacement, we have contact training. There's still a need for a robust, a robust general social safety net and uh, a robust public health service in addition to the healthcare system in the narrow sense. Um, I've tacked on a slide here at the end with a few further readings. I'm going to post this slideshow on my own blog. Uh, you can find it easily since it's imaginatively called Ed Dolan's Econ Blog. And um, if you look at the slideshow there, you can also, uh, all of the links will be active. Eventually, um, this um, entire uh, briefing is uh, supposed to be put, uh, the video of this uh, briefing will appear on the NISCAN website. So uh, that's all I've got for the moment. Uh, let me turn it over to Jeff and see what he's got to say, and then uh, we'll move on to Q&A. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ed, uh, thank, and thank NISCAN for asking me to participate in this uh, in this panel at this crazy time in, uh, in our history. Uh, I will say first that I very much enjoyed Ed's presentation. He, he framed the issues uh, very much as I would frame them. Uh, although I have a, you know, an, an aspect of my own personal uh, life and experience that, uh, you know, sees some of these issues in a, in a, in a somewhat different light. Um, you know, as a, as a physician, medical educator, a scientist, someone interested in policy, uh, you know, just about everything that I have done in my professional life is sort of turned on its head by, at least for the period of time ahead of us and recently behind us, you know, by this pandemic. Uh, and I, I could not have imagined uh, that uh, my, my experience as a physician and educator scientist and someone interested in policy would be so uh, overturned by uh, something so suddenly. But that is, uh, that is the way that it is. Um, I think that um, the, you know, a lot of what's occupying my mind these days are, you know, are issues uh, are somewhat outside the topic of this discussion. You know, how, how is biomedical science going to be both uh, at the lead in trying to provide solutions how will it change as a result of uh, this pandemic? Uh, it's a separate topic, but one that I'm very interested in. Uh, how is education going to change? It's going to change pretty significantly, I think, uh, in steps. It's going to accelerate certain trends. Uh, you know, I couldn't have believed that my medical school would, would send its students home, uh, whether they were in hospital training part or preclinically, and turning that, at least for a period of time, into uh, distance learning. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I have two daughters who were physicians in Boston uh, who have turned entirely into telemedicine, except for a one week period of being drafted into uh, being on a COVID service. And there you get to see, or at least I'm hearing from them, some of the incredible deficiencies in hospital organization related to this, the inadequate provision of protective uh, uh, devices for our physicians and nurses and other healthcare 
uh, individuals. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a very disorienting moment. Absolutely, it is the case that the healthcare system, you know, was not prepared with all the debates that you could have, no matter which system we might have had of the variations that are out there in the policy world, you know, they would not have been prepared for this. And that's because of both the pandemic itself, that is the virus and the disease that it causes, uh, the effect that at least in certain locations it has had on uh, the ability of uh, healthcare systems to function. Fortunately, it's only in a relatively limited number of settings where that has played out. The behavioral changes of uh, all of us not wanting to go and uh, be seen uh, in a setting where this disease is prevalent, that has changed the practice of, of medicine and preventive care. Uh, ongoing health care has been massively disrupted. Uh, and then, of course, the consequences of the, uh, the, the, the policy response to the pandemic, the economic and social uh, 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 implications also have tremendous effects on, on the health care system. Uh, the numbers that I hear about uh, deficits in our great Boston hospitals are almost hard to believe, you know, so I can't validate them, but I know that I'm hearing just massive amounts of uh, financial harm to the hospitals because as, as Ed pointed out, uh, the component of their revenues that uh, drive uh, any positive margin that they have uh, has essentially come to an end for a period of several months and in most places hasn't started up yet. Uh, and what remains is a uh, underfunded set of activities. And how that will play out, uh, I have no idea. Uh, somewhere in bills, somewhere there may be transfers of money. I don't know how those are taking place uh, and whether they will, uh, I'm pretty sure they won't suffice. And then what reactions will the healthcare system, our decentralized healthcare system, uh, how many reactions will there be to that? You know, there's lots of talking about furloughing physicians, cutting physician pay. Those things all have follow-ons that are very uh, difficult, at least for me, you know, to predict. What is extremely clear that a point that Ed made, and I would have to endorse, is that uh, once again, whatever your view of health policy, whatever your ideal system that you can imagine would be, this pandemic has raised uh, issues that require coordinated action at the level of, uh, you know, paying for uh, 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 the, uh, the, the research that needs to be done that might not otherwise be done as, as well, uh, to pay for vaccination, uh, to pay for the various testing regimes uh, that are debated, but one or other version of them has to be there. Uh, these need to be coordinated uh, and paid for, and uh, at least I'm far enough from the policy scene to be unaware of how well that is now being that is now being organized. Not to mention, uh, you know, paying for the uh, some of the ancillary aspects required to suppress uh, the pandemic. So um, perhaps I'll stop there and just say those are my my top level thoughts. Uh, these are really important issues, and they. they I'll make one last uh, comment, and that is that um, I, I would hate to see uh, people's view of what might be really important things to do to respond to the pandemic to become the leading uh, basis for deciding how, after the pandemic, the healthcare system should be in, uh, uh, reformed. I think the, you've got to be able to separate those two. Uh, uh, unless it were to become the case that we're constantly exposed to new pandemics and that becomes the new normal, uh, which would be pretty tragic. And I don't think healthcare reform will be our biggest issue if that's the case. So I'll stop there. Thank you both for providing such interesting perspective on what is um, undoubtedly a, a complex issue that impacts uh, all elements of all of our lives. Um, Ed received a, a comment in the thread that I think it's important to, to reiterate that um, the note about uh, employee-sponsored insurance being kind of a, a post-World War II um, 
element as a way to retain the workforce is not always uh, clear to those of us who don't uh, don't work in healthcare policy. And it always seems strange to me that the time that you would need uh, health insurance perhaps the most is uh, when you're unemployed and don't have an income and don't have that stability. So I thought that that was a really great point and someone noted it in the comments. So I will uh, start working through the Q&A as they come in and I'll yield them both to our expert panelists as I've just acknowledged. I am not an expert in healthcare policy, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and nor am I a doctor of any kind. So our first question is how will resistance to health policy reform by organizations such as the AMA affect what can be passed uh, legislatively? And I'm happy to, to take this on the top line and then turn it over. Uh, I am an expert uh, in government affairs. So I think when you have big trade associations like the AMA, they are going to be looking uh, to promote policies that protect their interests. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna be opposed to everything, uh, but they are gonna look uh, for ways that their, their licensing and their standards are upheld. So you probably aren't gonna be able to engage in most of these conversations without including them. Uh, and hopefully you can get their buy-in and, and not, uh, be subject to their opposition. So I will turn that question over uh, to Ed and Jeff to answer. Uh, well, well, I think this is a great question in. for Jeff since I'm not, I'm not a member yeah. of the AC AMA. <laughs> Jeff? Well, you might be happy or surprised to know that I've never been a member of the AMA. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think that, you know, during the course of my career and the time that I was Dean of Harvard Medical School, and now in the years since then, as I'm thinking about policy, it is very clear to me that a major impediment to any kind of healthcare reform uh, are the special interests, the very large, you know, concentrated interests. This is not unique to healthcare, but it's certainly evident to healthcare. And one of the reasons they are, these interests uh, are uh, particularly difficult to budge, I've now come to the conclusion, is because they're also seen as representing good stuff, you know, an important profession, the healing profession. You know, if you take hospital systems, hospitals are in, in Boston, the single biggest, uh, uh, you know, commercial organization uh, is the, uh, well, it's a nonprofit, but the single biggest business apart from government is one of our big healthcare providers, uh, Partners Healthcare System. And uh, you know these are very powerful organizations. They represent a great deal of the local economy. They are, you know, uh, leaders of the community. They're viewed as representative of what we do best in America: healthcare, science, advancing the frontiers. Uh, and uh, they, you know, uh, th but their interests are often uh, definably uh, against much change. They're against certain kinds of innovation. They're against new entrants. And uh, this is generally underappreciated by people other than certain policy wonks and former deans. Uh, and, but it is a very powerful thing. And the AMA is certainly a uh, group that protects the interests of uh, the existing practitioners in medicine. And I will hasten to add, it doesn't protect all of their interests equally. It's very heavily dominated by procedural specialties, the way that they have influenced, for example, the, uh, the rate for, uh, that physicians of different specialties are paid, uh, which they've been given that authority by various legislative means, uh, you know, is, is very unfair to uh, uh, some of the specialties. And I'll just end my comment here by giving one of the great ironies that I like to point out. So Medicare is, of course, the healthcare system uh, run as a government program uh, for the aged, uh, or at least over 65, not some people I know, like myself, don't consider themselves aged above 65. But uh, this system has the perhaps the lowest pay of any specialty for gerontology the specialty organized to facilitate healthcare for the aging. This has been known and pointed out for decades and it has not been possible to change that, despite the fact that a single legislative act could change it. 
and it's a legislatively driven program. So I'll stop there and uh, let Ed add something. Yeah, I just add one thing to that. I think that really uh, hits the nail on the head. Um, I, I would like to add that in uh, dealing with the AMA or any special interests of which there are many insurers, drug makers and so forth in the whole healthcare equation. <clears throat> I think uh, one thing that's almost sure is that uh, if any reform is going to be successful, it has to be approached on a bipartisan or nonpartisan basis. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, elegant um, proposals on the uh, far right and uh, far left, anyhow, not so many on the far right. Uh, but uh, all three of the proposals I've met have some degree of uh, bipartisan uh, appeal. Uh, uh, Ovik Roy, who's uh, one of the proponents of the Fair Care Act, has said that he had characterized it as an attempt to um, pursue a uh, conservative goals uh, using progressive, progressive goals using conservative methods. And um, I think that that's a good uh, way to uh, sum up what we need. Thank you for those thoughtful answers, certainly elaborated far more than I could. Our second question is, should federal lawmakers force states to develop a pandemic response so that there is a plan for the next pandemic? Is this better, I'm reading this question as, is this sort of plan better administered at the federal level or at the state level, or maybe there need to be two? And I'll turn that to either one of you. Um, obviously states have a role to play in uh, anything uh, that we do in the medical area, but uh, I think uh, my personal feeling is that in some regards, the uh, healthcare uh, response to the crisis reflects has been slow in part because the response is too fragmented rather than being too centralized. Uh, an example is the very important role being played by Medicaid in the crisis, which is run uh, very strongly at the state's levels. Um, I think that the, we would respond uh, more smoothly to any emergency if we had some reform of Medicaid to remove some of the uh, rather strong differences uh, between states. For example, uh, what happens to uh, people who lose their jobs? There's a huge difference between their access to alternative insurance, depending on whether they live in a Medicaid expansion state or uh, one that's uh, not expansion. Yeah, well, I guess I would agree with that. I, I do think that there are some elements where a federal response uh, should be in the lead, at the very least setting strong uh, incentives to uh, you know, follow minimum policies that would seem to be appropriate for a future pandemic uh, whenever it should come. Um, as a scientist, this, I'll just uh, admit to this that you know, one advantage of the, you know, of, of some variation among states is you get to see experiments and those experiments are valuable if they are being tallied quickly and lessons learned and then places change. And then the, so the, the negative to what I said is very often, you know, the states are uh, somewhat resistant to just seeing that they haven't done as well as some other state. Um, and of course, we're seeing this now broadly on the pandemic Rain, uh, uh, topic by you know national differences in policies, and there will be literally hundreds of books, PhD theses, and profes professorial promotions over the next decade based upon anal analyzing these various differences across uh, both states in the United States and states in the world to get to try to interpret. Uh, you know, which things worked better than others, but I would not, uh, I would not make it seem as that some of these are going to be easy. So right now there are papers flowing out every day uh, claiming that something changes one week in one country and that proves that what they did was right or wrong and those things will all, you know, turn out to be uh, premature. 
It sounds like you're uh, indicating one of my favorite, uh, I guess, idioms, which is hindsight is often 2020, and it's really hard to know right now who's getting it right and, and what the best practices may be moving forward. But um, I certainly will not be pursuing a PhD in the policy implications of the COVID-19 crisis, <laughs> although it sounds like it is a topic rich for deep analysis, but better left to somebody else. Next question is can and or should the US ramp up production of, of MDs or should we rely more on foreign healthcare workers? This is a really interesting question. I think Jeff, you're probably the best equipped to, to answer it, but it's at the intersection of some interesting things that Niskanen has worked on. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, I wrote a paper, a white paper uh, that's available on the Mercatus Institute website that was looking at uh, health provider workforce. And, you know, that has most of my ideas. And what we wrote in that paper, you know, is, is, is even more urgent now, you know, in this situation than it was before. But to just summarize the, the couple of key points, uh, I think we've had over bureaucratized and over regulated uh, physician workforce training and, uh, and licensing capabilities. Uh, the, these arose originally historically at a time when something was needed because there was no organization and there was no certification. And then over time, the processes became substantially influenced by the providers and their own interests, whatever, whatever they say. And I don't mean to say that they're not interested in the quality of their profession. Of course they are. But, but then there are also other influences. Uh, the consequent, and now I'll also say that there have been widely swinging debates over the last 25 years. Do we have too many doctors, too few doctors? It's gone back and forth, and I'm not gonna opine on that you know, right now. But there has been a view, I'd say the dominant view, that uh, we could probably use more health providers not only as a general number, we don't need more in Boston, but we need more in many places that have too few. So in poorer communities, in rural communities, the distribution of kinds of providers has been influenced by payment mechanisms, and we have fewer primary care, family medicine, uh, gerontology, as I said. So something needs to be done about that. There was a shift over the last 10 years where uh, the, the, the powers that be uh, agreed that we needed to train more MDs. So there was a loosening up and, a, and actually encouragement of increasing the number of positions uh, that, you know, seats in medical schools in America, that has gone up. Um, but um, I think it could go up more. Uh, I think there's going to be a trend towards trying to reduce the duration of training. A few schools have now gone from four to three. Some have six-year programs that include college. Those things should be, should be revisited and are being revisited. Then there's two other things to briefly mention. You know, one is uh, bringing in foreign trained doctors, and I've written a bit about that. I believe that uh, we should make it easier for foreign trained doctors to come to this country and become licensed. Uh, they can, they do now, but the restrictions on that uh, 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 are probably greater than they should be. Uh, these physicians end up doing extremely well in America. Many, many become leaders, uh, and they also tend to go into some of these underserved areas, more primary care specialties, and things of that sort, although they also become great experts in the uh, uh, some of the specialties like whatever, cardiac surgery, brain surgery, et cetera. Um, and then the other thing that I think is very important is um, allowing some of these relatively new professions that are not MDs, but give care and they give it very well in the proper circumstances. So now we went from having, of course, nurses, which we've had for a long time, to nurse practitioners. And there are some new rec you know, uh, uh, licensing capabilities for uh, independent practice by nurse practitioners, which I favor. And then you have a whole new field called um, the, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, but um, the uh, practitioners who are not MDs, they're not nurses, but they uh, 
They can both deliver primary care. They can work in many special areas, uh, physician's assistants, excuse me. And that is a very rapidly growing domain. And as you might expect, there are now starting to be some interprofessional conflicts. So some of the nurses don't like as many uh, 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 physician's assistants uh, and uh, on and on. But I would like to see more uh, uh, possibility because I'll just make one last point, And that is with the, maybe it's about a 30% or so increase in the number of seats in American medical schools, the number of applicants from America who get into American medical schools hasn't changed. So that means we have many more people who want to be doctors and many of them can't do it. And my prediction would be most of them would be very fine doctors and they might end up going to places where we need them. They might end up driving down the cost of, uh, uh, of physician services. Uh, and I think that those would be good things. Thank you, Jeff. Again, I'm so glad that uh, you answer all the tough questions and I just have to read them. <laughs> Our next question is, diet is key to health. How can that be addressed? Agribusiness has pushed the US to a diet that leads to obesity, et cetera. I think this hits on some of the conversations that we've heard about the comorbidities that COVID-19 seems to exploit and certainly uh, food deserts um, and inaccessibility of, of good food options is something we talk about kind of uh, in urban areas, but I'm sure it also implicates some, some rural communities too. I'm not sure, Jeff or, or Ed, if either one of you would like to expound upon that. Well, I mean, I'm happy to say something. I mean, for about 40 years, my, my area of medicine and research was diabetes and obesity. So it is something that I've been professionally involved with. Um, and we, this is one of the great, uh, another one of these ironies that you sort of can't believe it until you see it, right? So over the course of my career, the amount that we have learned about what causes diabetes and obesity has gone up by about 5,000 fold. If I, you know, compared to what we knew when I was a trainee and what we know now, it's massively increased. And in proportion to that, the prevalence of these disorders has gone up. So, uh, you know, this is one of those uh, ironies that you don't necessarily, by learning about a disease, uh, prevent it from happening. Now, the com it's very, very complex. You asked specifically about nutrition and obesity. You know, nutrition is a complicated area. Uh, it is, um, of course, there's, there's plenty of opinions and there's a lot of data, but, um, and, and undoubtedly there are contra contributing factors towards the increase in obesity in this country coming from nutrition uh, and the approach to nutrition. But even then, uh, you know, I'm common, con constantly asked to arbitrate among various warring factions regarding the proper nutrition answers, right? So I would, the one that I tend to go with for whatever it's worth, and I, you know, I have studied this, but I would say that we went through a period where the increase in prevalence of obesity in this country was pretty well parallel with being told that we should be on low fat diets because they promoted cardiac dysfunction. And therefore we should be on high carbohydrate diets. And uh, that led to uh, a massive uh, change within the food uh, industry to try to say, oh, low fat, high sugar, terrific. And uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but not a lot more. And then the, the, the ingestion of simple sugars went up. And I don't think there's any doubt that that has helped promote you know, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and all the rest. And there's now a big pushback against that. But you know, as often occurs, you get a swing to points of view that may be too extreme in the other direction. So you have many advocates of the keto diet and all things of that sort that I think are exaggerated in terms of uh, making them public recommendations. And then the final thing on this is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, monitoring and influencing diet is like a hard thing to do. People determine what they want to eat on a daily basis. They determine what they want to buy. It's influenced by a lot of things. So, uh, uh, but I think many of us have noticed that both diabetes and obesity are 
things that increase the morbidity if you are infected with, uh, with COVID-19. And uh, many of my friends are going overtime right now trying to figure out why that is. Some economists have suggested that uh, an effective way to get people to watch their health is to make sure that they bear part of the costs of their medical care and that don't have complete first dollar coverage. Um, personally, the research I've read has said that that is not as strong an influence as economists might hope. Uh, although for uh, reasons of fairness and macroeconomic policy, I do favor a system that uh, has uh, people who can afford to do so pay a fair share of their own care. Uh, I don't think that there's strong evidence that, um, that we can pay people to stay thin or to uh, avoid sugar. Yeah, I mean, I'm maybe at the margins, there can be some of that, but, um, and I know in our, in the health policy department at Harvard, where there are some people with pretty interesting market oriented backgrounds, you know, their own empirical research has suggested that some of these incentives don't work as well as many of us had hoped. We have about 10 more minutes and two more questions. So I think we'll be able to get through it. And certainly if uh, any other attendees have, have questions, I encourage you to submit them. It seems to me that one of the things the pandemic has revealed is how neglected and weak our public health systems, e.g. state health departments have become. I've been shocked really that the novel coronavirus was not stopped earlier in the US. And this, in addition to White House uh, action, is the reason. What healthcare reform proposals address this weakness? Uh, I would say that that is uh, something that none of them uh, <clears throat> address adequately because, uh, as I mentioned, healthcare, we want to talk about healthcare reform as we know it. Healthcare reform means uh, how to pay the bills uh, for uh, doctors and hospitals, uh, but uh, <clears throat> the question of who pays uh, for the public health system is treated as being completely separate from that. I think that's a mistake. So I would like to invite uh, all reformers to think about how a more holistic approach could be taken that would somehow integrate uh, public health more closely into healthcare policy. I could not agree more with what Ed said. I would just uh, emphasize and repeat that um, this pandemic has revealed the weakness of our public health system, which tends to be, you know, uh, of course, there's a there's a the CDC, which has been undermined uh, recently. Uh, there are the local health departments in states and localities. Uh, if there is one good thing that can come out of this, that you know, all people of goodwill should realize, is just what Ed said: is that we need to have a national plan to enhance the public health infrastructure, because that is what government is for. You could disagree about whether it's for some other things, but it should be for the public health because no one else can provide that. And that has not had adequate attention. Uh, you know, various public health school deans have called attention to it, but they look like they're just trying to, you know, strengthen the, uh, the support for their schools. This is a national health issue and this should be uh, a real big focus going forward of policy think tanks, in my opinion. Thank you. Three more questions and about seven more minutes, so I think we can do it. Uh, the UCC, which I believe stands for Universal Catastrophic Coverage, is a great idea, but a key challenge is the transition from the current system. What are you suggesting for that transition? I think, Ed, you hit upon this. Yeah, for a transition uh, from the system. Well, <laughs> first of all, we have to make it um, <clears throat> as easy as 
possible to transition. For example, one of the questions, which is a little bit easier to answer, is uh, what to do about Medicare and universal catastrophic coverage. I think there the answer is relatively easy, that uh, you should design the transition in a way that people who are currently on Medicare can stay on it if they want, uh, can move to the new system if they like, uh, and at people uh, below some age uh, limit at the time of passage uh, lose the choice for traditional Medicare. If we look at the other end of the spectrum, uh, there's probably more trouble with the Medicaid component. That's going to be very difficult. Uh, it, it, one of the parts of the program that most urgently needs reform, but it's going to be one of the most difficult to federalize. There are some theories about how that can be done. Uh, one theory is the federal government somehow works uh, some sort of swap with the states, whereas uh, the federal government entirely takes over uh, <clears throat> Medicaid per se and replaces it with, uh, with the universal catastrophic system. <laughs> universal catastrophic coverage, by the way, uh, would uh, have uh, provide uh, first dollar coverage for people who are now on Medicaid so that they would have no premiums or deductibles or co-pays. Uh, <clears throat> so the federal government takes over that system, but in exchange, um, the state governments agree to take over uh, perhaps uh, mental health, perhaps some public health burdens so that there's sort of uh, no uh, sharp fiscal impact. Uh, that's going to be a difficult one. Uh, it sounds like there's some moving parts there. There are some moving parts there. As with any great policy discussion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our final question. Should we provide workers compensation as part of the pandemic response? And Ed, I think that this is in your wheelhouse. And if not, our colleague Sam Hammond, certainly. Um, well, Ideally, to me, workers' compensation, at least the medical part of workers' compensation, uh, should be uh, brought into a, a broader uh, system so that I would say, uh, yes, that should be treated. Uh, illnesses or accidents that occur on the job, in principle, in my mind, should not be treated any differently than those that occur in the home or the baseball diamond or anything else. Uh, amateur baseball diamond, I guess, pro players are uh, in the workers' compensation field. So, uh, yeah, I would say let's fold that in together. The more, the, the fr it's the fragmentation of the American system that's really one of its greatest weaknesses. We have this uh, chopped up into so many little pieces, each one addressing uh, certain uh, sometimes small part of the community, whether it's the Indian Health Service or uh, Veterans Administration, which plays an important role, but it's really and quantitatively not a big part of the picture. Uh, we need to get rid of these little chunks, all of which uh, try to solve the same problems in different ways. Well, thank you, uh, Ed and Jeff, for such a thoughtful conversation this afternoon. And thank you to all our uh, attendees for joining us for this conversation. Um, we hope that you will join us for future presentations from the Niskanen Center. And Well, Kodiak seems to have run into technical difficulties there, but um, I would like to say uh, thank you very much for attending on behalf of all the participants. Thank you.